Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation to join this important uh, effort at understanding uh, inclusion of the older patient in cl cancer clinical trials. I'm Lily Petrozelli. Um, I've been working in early development in industry for uh, over a decade. I'm presently at Insight Corporation, but what I'm going to talk to you today reflects my thoughts on where we are in enrolling older patients in cancer clinical trials from an industry perspective. Enrollment of the older patients in industry uh, and really across the entire clinical trial spectrum uh, has been exhibiting a downward trend over the last uh, 20 years, despite a recognition of how important it is to include the older patient in cancer trials. Over 60% of cancers are in people over 65. However, only about a third of participants in phase two and three studies are from this older group. And there's a downward trend as patients become older uh, and particularly older than 75. So, you know, what's going on? I think that it was fairly uh, insightful just taking a look at a recent presentation at ASH um, in blood uh, on 20 trials enrolling 6,000 patients. There were no age limits in the vast majority uh, of these studies. However, there was evidence that patients enrolled in the study were significantly younger than uh, the median age group in patients with a particular disease. And they looked across about 22 diseases. And if one looks at diffuse large B cell and AML, where the average age is in the late 60s, early 70s of patients who present with these diseases, on trials, the average age was seven to eight years younger. So there's really um, evidence uh, over multiple indications and diseases that we have work to do. So where can we start and, and what's been a point of focus? Well, it's clear that who to include and who to exclude from trials may be impacting uh, the older patient more uh, significantly. If you look to 20, uh, 280-ish randomized clinical trials, about a third had multiple uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria that possibly were not justified uh, based on what uh, the disease or the molecule understanding. And about 84% had at least one exclusion, exclusion criteria that possibly was not justified. So this may be a place and an easy place to look. I think it's important to consider this because restrictions of enrollment of older patients in early trials uh, may miss safety signals that can be managed. We may limit the use of uh, drugs based on this in older patients where the drug is really effective. And there's always going to be this tension between having a homogeneous population uh, for a clear signal and establishing safety around a molecule and, and seeing early safety signals. So how can we uh, learn more earlier to try to inform those trials that enroll the uh, majority of patients uh, in clinical studies. So I think one area that was uh, an easy one to focus on when I entered industry was prior history of cancer. When I first started, if you had a history of having a prior cancer, you couldn't enter a study, even in the early space, where you might really learn a lot about um, toxicities and uh, dose adjustments. And in fact, reviewing a disease like lung cancer, uh, trials excluded patients even when they didn't have survival endpoints. And it's possible that even when they do have survival endpoints, there may be hints that the uh, prior cancer did not convey an adverse effect on the lung cancer specific uh, survival. I think there's a a lot of work that needs to be done in this area and really understanding how uh, one looks at this around survival. And I suspect not all cancers are the same, but it's, it's food for thought. And I think it's really particularly important um, in patients who have had cancer and surviving over five years, could they be considered earlier in, uh, in earlier studies? And can we think about uh, how to learn uh, to where to draw the lines for these areas. Another uh, thing that I'd like to focus on, what, other, what are the other key areas that we could focus on to improve enrollment in older patients? 
uh, restrictions are based on medications in about half the trials. I think this is important. I think one of the goals early on is to find, characterize the pharmacokinetic properties of molecules, characterize the safety. But there are times when we know an awful lot going into clinic or early in clinical studies, we may be able to liberalize the medication list and it may not have to be as stringent as we think. It's, it's sometimes easier to take the most stringent path forward, but as patients get older, it's very unusual not to be on co-medication. So I think it's something really worth focusing on. And perhaps we can think about ways to gain information on backgrounds of certain medications as we advance molecules through clinical investigation, in particular earlier. It'll help open up those later studies. Comorbidities are key and most patients and most people as they get older have diseases that uh, really don't affect their lifestyle, but nonetheless, affect their medication and may affect their inclusion in trials. So I think we have to take a quick look at when these are absolutely necessary and when we're, we're really um, potentially excluding patients when we don't need to. So I think that's an area and I think it really ties into the measurement of organ dysfunction. LFTs and renal function are common areas where we uh, have uh, we have prior knowledge from toxicology and we have prior knowledge around the molecule and how it's excreted or metabolized. So there may be opportunities to look at renal function and decide when it's absolutely necessary to have the most stringent inclusion exclusion criteria. And when possibly it, there, there is um, room to uh, lower those criteria for coming into study. And that would parallel what happens to people as they age. So we may be able to enroll more patients if we take a look at when it's really absolutely necessary to have a highly restrictive uh, baseline renal function. And I say the same thing around liver function tests, particularly if we understand the mechanisms of molecules, when is something truly toxic to liver and when would something molecules give us a signal that may not be long-standing or may not interfere long-term with the development of the molecule. So it's worth just thinking about these things when we develop molecules and maybe not one size fits all. Um, and it, I think on the other hand, it's important to pay attention to the mo molecule you're using. I think it's very different antibodies and small molecules. They require different exclusion criteria. And sometimes people tend to carry through a generic set of inclusion exclusion criteria. And we should probably keep a close eye on that and think about it in the context of who may not be enrolled in a study. And there's a potential to lose the early assessment of dose adjustments if we don't really understand how these drugs are behaving in the elderly population and how they're affecting their organ function. So I think it's time for us to, to pay attention to how and when we're going to uh, tackle patients who might not have perfectly uh, normal organ function, and that could really coincide with aging. Socioeconomic issues, I think, are quite important. Travel, the family support, how it uh, taxes a family are, are things that older people may opt not to do a study because of what it does to other members of the family. So I think we have to think about the patient, but we also have to think about more holistically about who is involved with this patient's care and what it will take for them to help this person participate in a trial. And then I think many of the studies we do, and I take responsibilities of the industry side are complicated, have a clinical plan, multiple assessments, and they really may make it more challenging for the older patient to participate, to come in all the time. And I think what we learned from COVID is there may be things we can do that don't require the office visit. And that's been something that we have not uh, always thought as, as an option in oncology in early development in particular. And we might be able to, to really help patients have an easier time on clinical trials. So moving forward, I think um, there's clearly been an awareness of the uh, trend with older patients. I think the NIH is looking very closely at this and they really wanna pay attention to this in their sponsored studies, but that's, Something that knowing that is happening, I think in the industry side, we also uh, pay need to pay attention to that. I think the FDA workshop um, that identified key areas of impact and inclusion exclusion criteria across studies can be applied broadly and looked at, you know, with the eye towards an older patient, things like e uh, performance status, 
it gets an area where we can really think about how to apply performance metrics to the older population, maybe not one size fits all. And um, the enrollment of older patients, um, we could take a close look at what it means to have had a prior cancer and when, when we need to exclude patients and when we can include patients, as I said, organ function, comorbidities and co-medications and the assessments of logistics. I'm looking forward to hearing people's thoughts and, uh, and taking questions on this important area in drug development. And again, thank you.